to Jesus now. All to Jesus now. Holding nothing back. Holding nothing back. I surrender, I surrender. I Thanks, God, that you are with us. Thanks that you delight in uh, being with your, your kids. Thanks that you meet us where we are and we don't have to fix ourselves up first. I pray that we would be open to uh, whatever it is you have to say today. Open our hearts and minds. Give us a quiet spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So you guys can be seated. Good morning. It's great to be here today and not have to sing in front of you. <clears throat> I'm only going to be with you a short time, and both of my children went to a Christian college. They went to Asbury, and I remember what they would say mercilessly about some of the speakers. And I'm quite aware of that as I'm in front of you. And um, how can I say something to you in a couple of moments that has any meaning? Uh, and so many of you are in different places. Some of you are struggling with your faith, and others are firm in that. Some of you are dealing with health problems, and some of you are the picture of health. Uh, some of you have come from great families. And others of you are in families that right now are 
fallen apart. Um, well, I decided to put together a, a list of, of a handful of things that I've been a Christian for about uh, 15 years, that's all. I became a Christian uh, in midlife and I was a physician and chief of staff at a hospital and head of an emergency department uh, when I picked up a Bible and read it for the first time. <clears throat> and uh, God has given me a lovely opportunity over the last 15 years to get a, a, a picture of the church that's broader than most people get. I've gotten to speak at the White House, the National Cathedral 12 times, the Senate, big churches, little churches, from one end of the globe to the other. And I've, over the last decade and a half, begun to notice some things that make other people grow in their faith and in their enjoyment of their faith. And I've noticed what's worked for me. And so in um, these couple of minutes that we have together, I'm gonna try to share some of the things that I've found that have worked for me if they work for you, great. And if they don't, don't say anything bad about me, okay? Um, we live in a society where things are condensed to media and everything is edited and people seem to do spectacular things right off the bat in their lives. And that has not been the case for me. I have found that life is a bit more of a struggle than just succeeding on the first try out. Uh, academically, I flunked out of high school. Uh, I, I ended up uh, getting a, a diploma in a uh, vocational tech program where I graduated with a 1.3 grade point average. Can anybody here beat that? Um, and so academically, I didn't, uh, and in many things, I have not succeeded to begin with. And I want to tell you, eventually I went to college and eventually I got into medical school early. Um, but I want to tell you about my first week on the job at a hospital on the coast of New England. And um, there's a saying that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And think about that as I tell you this story of my first week on the job at this hospital. Uh, on Monday morning, I start and I have a guy come in. He's like one of the first patients I have and he's 91 years old. And he's never been sick a day in his life. And uh, I go to see him, and I begin to immediately get the impression there's some, a big deal about this guy. He just had a, a, an air about him of somebody who cared and loved and that sort of thing. And he owned the biggest construction company in the state. Never been sick a day in his life, and his children loved him, and his employees loved him. He owns the biggest construction company in Maine, and he never laid anybody off in the winter. And that may mean nothing to you, but it meant a whole lot to his employees, and he was beloved. Uh, within <clears throat> a half an hour of him landing in the emergency department, there must have been 20 dump trucks <laughs> parked outside the hospital. And just, just this huge family in the waiting room uh, rooting for him and everything. And he had no prior history. I thought, this is going to be easy. I'll get to the bottom of this. I went out and talked to his family. He said, I'm going to order some tests. I'll figure out what's wrong with your, your dad, and, and things will be OK. And uh, then in the next 15 minutes, he did something he had never done before. He died. He just dropped dead on me. And there was nothing I could do to bring him back. And I had to go out and tell the family that their beloved father and the patriarch of this family was dead. Well, this was a lovely family, and the next day they took out a full-page ad on the paper, and I want to read what they had to say. Our beloved father was never sick a day in his life until this past Monday morning when he went to Coastal Hospital and met the newest member of the medical staff, doctors, please. <laughs> Even though our father died immediately after seeing Dr. Sleeth, we know that he and the nurses tried their hardest, and we wish to thank them and to welcome Dr. Sleeth to our community. That's my first day on the job. Let me tell you about how Friday went. <clears throat> now, every hospital has a legendary, nice nurse. They just, every hospital I've worked in has one that just rises above all the rest. And in this hospital, her name was Joanne, 
And uh, on Friday morning, she was helping a new nurse move a patient. New nurse didn't know what they were doing. And they smashed Joanne's finger between a bed and a wall, moving a patient. So she came down with what's called a subungual hematoma. And if you've ever smashed your thumb with a hammer or anything like that, it's where all this blood collects under the fingernail. It's exquisitely painful. And I've been trained to drain them using a burr uh, drill. And you drill a little hole through the nail, and the blood squirts out, and the person feels better. But they didn't have any drills at this hospital. They had electrocautery units. And the thought of burning through that throbbing nail, just, you know, without doing something to numb it up, just bothered me. And they had something called um, ethyl chloride in the emergency department, which is a spray that you can spray on and it evaporates so fast that it'll freeze an area and, uh, and numb it up. And they don't have it in hospitals anymore, and I'm going to tell you why. Because if you don't get all the fumes away, you catch the patient on fire, which is what I did with Joanne. <clears throat> well, when you've killed the town patriarch and set the best nurse in the city on fire in a single week, the word spreads, well, pretty fast. <clears throat> My first lesson to you is keep the faith. God is not a God of how you do the first time out. God is a God of second and third and 70 times seven chances. It's not how you begin this race. It's how you end that matters. So keep the faith. We have a record of how Jesus began his ministry. In Luke 4, he got up and preached at his hometown synagogue. And he said the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And he was there to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, deliver the captive, to give recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, to preach the Sabbath, the Jubilee year. What was the reaction to Jesus' first day on the job? They tried to throw him off the cliff. <laughs> if you are a Christian, you have been given a great commission to preach the gospel to those who are poor in spirit, to heal the brokenhearted, to set captives to sin and addiction free, to give spot sight to the spiritually blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to remember the Sabbath. If you struggle with sin yourself, remember that God never tires of forgiving you. It's us who run out of the gumption and the guts and the courage to ask for forgiveness. If you're having a rough start or a rough go with something, keep the faith and ask God for forgiveness again and again. Lesson number two, be generous. Work on developing a generous spirit. God loves a cheerful giver. As I've traveled around uh, the country and the glo globe and met so many Christians, they have one thing in common, the ones that are bright as stars, even though they may be at the end of their life, and that is generosity. God loves the cheerful giver. Buy the pizza. Leave the change in the soda machine. I never get the chains out. Do you know how good it makes you feel to come up and find a couple of quarters in the soda machine? I bet you Bill Gates probably feels better on that day. Um, our consumerist culture says that you should wring the last penny out of every dollar, but we have a God who delights in generosity. I recall in the emergency department uh, an example of this uh, to the negative side. And I had a man that came in and uh, he, he was fairly ill um, and I went to see him and I got shooed away. He was on a cell phone and he was talking to his realtor, actually he was yelling at his realtor, kind of, I'm not going to take their offer or whatever. And apparently there was a young couple trying to buy his house, they were a thousand or two thousand dollars short on his asking price, and he wasn't going to budge, and he was angry about it, and he hung up the phone, and 
I admitted him to the hospital and kind of forgot all about it. <clears throat> about six hours later, they called me uh, from the floor where he was admitted. They couldn't get a hold of his doctor at that moment. I think it was a Saturday or something. Would I mind coming over and signing the death certificate? No. So I went over to sign it and I said, is there family I should call? He had no family. I said, are there friends? He has no friends. Imagine having only a few hours to live and not giving the house away. I think that was God's last chance to him. Um, if he had given that house away, he would have died in a completely different place. Jesus says, I come quickly. The time to begin to learn generosity is right where you are. And I know you're not, most of you aren't making a salary, but you need to begin to develop that generous heart and spirit. Be generous. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it will be put into your wallet. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So generosity is my second tip to you in going through life and staying in love with God. Lesson number three, invest in friendships. I worry that at the pace that life goes for you and your generation, which I didn't experience, we didn't have cell phones in our pocket, um, and, and the amount of social media and that type of thing, that real true friendships, knowing each other face to face, is becoming rarer and rarer. Good friends are a treasure. They are something to be prayed for and worked for and nurtured. But a word of warning, choose your friends wisely. Avoid those who sit in the seat of the scoffer. Avoid cynics. Choose friends who sharpen and build your faith. Not by who, who's popular or pretty or in at that moment, but who builds your faith? Who do you walk away from an encounter with them and say, I've got a little bit better idea of who God is? <clears throat> Friends are like trees. They're best planted 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But the second best time is right now. And we have the example of the friendship between Jesus and Lazarus and whom he cried for and, and brought back from the dead. And Jesus and John, that apostle who felt so comfortable with the Lord that he laid on the Lord's chest and heard the Lord's heartbeat. Jesus said there was no greater love that we could have than have friends that were willing to die for. He said that others would know us, he, they would know the followers of Christ by how we loved each other. It's, it's sort of a line that gets uh, forgotten. It's all about loving the unlovables, and that's true. But the world is looking at us and how we treat each other and how we love each other and what kind of friendships we have. I am fortunate that my best friend for the last 40 years has been my wife, Nancy. And um, so friendship is, is the third uh, lesson that I've learned. Lesson four, let the Bible teach you so many of us want to instruct God instead of letting him teach us. He left us a book to believe in, believe in it. I read the Bible for the first time in my 40s. I'd never read one before. I didn't own it. The first Bible that I picked up was in a waiting room. I said, I don't have one of these at home. I think I'd like to read what's in it. It's a big book. Where do you start? Good thing my parents named me Matthew and not Numbers. Um, and I stole it, and I, it, it was a trap, the Gideon set, and, uh, and my whole life has changed since that moment. Life up until that point to me was like being out on the ocean, kind of lost with your sail ripped off and no uh, rudder that's working and no compass and no chart. 
And as somebody who lived uh, for a long time on the coast of Maine, I'll tell you, you get out there at night and you don't know where you are and it's a real scary thing. Life is still like an ocean. It is vast and it's unpredictable. But being given the Bible was like being given a compass, a chart, a rudder, a sail. Um, if you don't know what to do, let the Bible teach you. It's going to tell you to do some things that are unpopular. It's going to tell you some things to do that are uncomfortable. But let it teach you. I've found it's particularly hard at a couple times, or particularly useful at a couple times in my life to read through the entire Bible asking it a single question. If you haven't done that, do it. I promise that the Lord will reward you for that. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to give a talk, and I forget exactly which one this is, uh, when it is, but about a subject out of Scripture. Uh, it's not tonight, because tonight is, is Sabbath. Um, look on the schedule. But I'm going to give a talk about a subject in Scripture in which I'm going to talk about the most mentioned living thing on earth uh, in the Bible other than people. It shows up on the first page of the Bible, the first Psalm, the first page of the New Testament, and the last page of Scripture, and none of you have had a sermon on it. Charles Spurgeon preached on it again and again and again, and when, when I go and I start talking on it, nobody has heard of it. The point being that the Bible has so much there um, to teach us, and so I invite you to come and uh, to hear about that um, as I talk about it. Number five, be thankful. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. As a doctor, I was a pretty cynical guy. It kind of goes with the territory. To be a non-Christian emergency physician is to sort of see the worst that humanity has to offer. It's hard not to get cynical when you're trying to get people better and to help them live and they're hell-bent on killing themselves. <clears throat> One way when I became a Christian that I found to tackle this cynicism that was just a part of my soul was to keep a gratitude journal. And it was pretty tough to begin with. I'm like, what am I grateful for today? Um, and uh, as it went along, it begot, began to get easier and easier and easier. Has anybody here ever eaten popcorn and gotten some caught between your teeth? Yeah, everybody has. But you live in the world of dental floss. Imagine before dental floss was around. Imagine before the refrigerator was invented. Antibiotics, it made such a huge difference in what I could do for patients and everything automobiles, phones. It's, it's not that God doesn't want us to have things. I think that God doesn't want us to have things we take for granted. And so a, a gratitude journal begins to, to change your heart about these little things. And as you begin to be grateful for the little things in life, you begin to realize there's really big things like love and friendship and the Lord and forgiveness and on and on, parents, grandparents. What I found that over time, my gratitude journal morphed into a miracle journal. When you start getting thankful for the little things, God, I found, starts sending you big things. And so my gratitude journal morphed into a miracle journal. Start with just gratitude for simple things. That's lesson number five. Number six is remember the Sabbath. How many of you here, I'm going to put you on the spot, raise your hand if you keep a Sabbath once a week. That's actually more than, uh, more than most uh, groups. Sabbath keeping, as I understand theology, is not a condition of getting into heaven. It's just the condition that heaven is in if you get there. When I became a Christian, uh, we started keeping a Sabbath. I read through the Bible. I came up on the Ten Commandments. There was no footnote that said optional at this point. 
And so my whole family and I began to keep a Sabbath. We didn't know any better. And it has changed the course of my life and my children's life and now starting my grandchildren. You go to a school that has Wesleyan in the name. The Wesleys were fairly amazing people. And uh, later in her life, um, uh, the mother of John and Charles Wesley was asked to write a letter, basically, how is it that you raise such great kids? The first thing that she taught them before they could, quote, walk or well go, was to remember the Sabbath. If you don't have a Sabbath in your life, you will begin to confuse yourself with God. It is only when you let go of the wheel and find out that somebody else is in control that you begin to get an appreciation and trust in God. Uh, I need to take my hands off the wheel one day out of seven. Uh, if you come to the evening chapel, that's what I'm going to talk about and give you a book to encourage you with it. So remember the Sabbath. And I, I will just tell you this, as I have uh, met so many pastors, uh, and our, the nonprofit that I run has been doing a five-year study on 2,000 pastors in North Carolina. I can tell you who's going to make it in some ways and who's not. The Sabbath keepers, the ones that delight in the Sabbath of the Lord, are the ones that do well over time. And there's no exception for you. Um, so remembering the Sabbath, to delight in it, is uh, my sixth. And the last is prayer. And this is one that for some reason I forget and forget and forget. I'm getting a little better a decade and a half into my uh, faith. But there's so many times that I'm trying to do things my own way and, uh, and I forget to pray. Um, how many of you have seen that movie, The War Room? It's a must-see. Uh, I've got a little five-by-five five prayer room. Uh, when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. God's work uh, is a powerful thing. I want to give you just an example of how I was kind of reinforced on this praying I was, I travel a ton. I've spent more time in the air than uh, I, I can, you know, keep track of. So I'm, uh, I'm in Atlanta, and I've been working in the city, and I go back uh, to the airport, and I'm uh, going to get on my, well, my flight's a few hours. I have to wait at the airport. But I, I go to check in, and my credit card isn't being read by the no-service kiosk, you know. And there's a long line of people. And so I go and get in the line, and this guy cuts right in front of me. Frou-frou hair, talking on his cell phone, no clue that there's another human on the planet. And I thought to myself, if I had a stick, I'd hit him in the head. <laughs> now, this is not a very Christian thought, is it? And it hit me, this isn't a very Christian thought. And I said, Lord, I need some help here because I can't think a single nice thing about this person. And I know you love him, but I'd like to hit him in the head with a stick. <laughs> help me out here. Well, I got interrupted from my pair by this guy tugging on my, my arm, this uh, man about that, that high, and he had an airline vest on and everything. He said, um, have you tried the machine? I said, I already tried it, but it didn't work. He said, come on over, let's try it. We go over and it doesn't work. Great, now I've lost my place again in the line. And he said, ah, come on. And, and, he, and he goes behind the you know, place where they've got the real machines. And he said, now there's an earlier flight that leaves in just a couple minutes. He said, do you have, um, do you have any baggage you have to check in? I said, no, no, just, just me, I can, I can go. He said, do you want to go on the earlier flight? And I said, yeah. He said. I'm going to have to put you in first class. And I said, OK. <laughs> so I leave, and I turn around, and there's that guy I wanted to hit with a stick still in line. And there's that fellow, and he's waving at me like this, and he looked exactly like George Burns and Oh God. So I don't know. <clears throat> the, the point, it, that might be not your generation. Um, <laughs> the point is to remember to pray. 
Now, there are many other things I could have left in this list, but these are the things that I have seen in common, not only for myself, but for other pastors and for other Christians as I go about, and now for my children. Um, I have two children, they're both married. My son is a pediatrician in Kenya, and uh, my daughter is married, her husband's finishing um, seminary in December, and they're going to Kenya for six months, and they better come back or I'm going to go get them. Uh, but I, th I hope that these are the things they pass on to my grandchildren and whatnot. So, that's my, those are my pieces of advice, nothing very fancy. Just try one, start with it, and see how it changes your life. And now I'm going to, uh, oh wow, you get out of here early. Isn't that good? Is being done early good? Or do you want me to read? No. Okay. Let me pray for you. If everyone will stand, I will pray for you. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, gracious Abba, I ask your blessing on these brothers and sisters, these men and women, as they are beginning their careers and as they're studying to go forth in life, um, that, that your grace abound in their lives, um, that uh, you teach them to the Sabbath, you, you teach them to delight in your word, that you give them friendships and thankfulness, and that when things don't always go right for them, they remember that they wanted to throw your son off the cliff the first time he preached. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.